Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> this is uh, Peter van Overs uh, speaking. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, today our session, stream one, on the history and future of lipids, which are the building blocks of the structure and function of living cells and their role in drug delivery. Uh, I'm the moderator of this uh, stream, and um, to give you some background on myself, I'm a pharmacist by tra training, PhD in biochemistry, and I worked in the pharmaceutical industry since 1984, mainly in the drug delivery area. Um, and um, since a couple of years, I'm, uh, I have my own company as, as consultant in pharma innovation. I'm also linked to the Phospholipid Research Center as a member of the Scientific Advisory Board. Uh, in this stream, we have um, a few um, uh, interesting um, speakers invited, and I will introduce them uh, to you before they start their uh, seminars. The, um, the stream itself is um, it, it's, uh, dedicated to uh, liposomes and lipid nanoparticles because it's claimed that they are the most advanced drug delivery systems in uh, nano medicine uh, because regulatory authorities have approved numerous LMPs and liposome drugs over the past decades, and we now have a wide variety of lipid-based nanoparticle formulation for multiple applications. In nanomedicine, LMPs and liposomes are probably the best choices for cargo transfer because they fulfill many of the necessary aspects of a drug delivery vehicle. Frankly, without lipids, there will be no light speed and efficient COVID-19 vaccine. This session will elucidate the evolution of phospholipids and discuss the future potential for lipid-based drug delivery and therapy. So the first speaker of uh, today is um, uh, PD Dr. Simon uh, Drescher. He, is, uh, he studied uh, pharmacy at the Martin Luther University in, uh, in Halle, in Germany, and completed in 2008 his PhD, the field of pharmaceutical chemistry and physical chemistry on the synthesis and aggregation behavior of bipolar phospholipids. He received uh, habilitation as a uh, private docent uh, in pharmaceutical chemistry at uh, the university in Halle in 2017. <clears throat> he joined the uh, Phospholipid Research Center Heidelberg in December 2019, and since uh, February 2021, he is the managing director of this uh, institute. Dr. Drescher's main interest are the synthesis of artificial uh, mono bipolar phospholipids, the physical, physical chemical characterization of lipids, and the application of liposomes for drug delivery. So, Simon will now give his seminar on um, the Phos phospholipid research uh, center. So, he introduces his own institute and he will discuss the current research of phospholipids and their use in drug delivery. Simon, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Peter. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, and you can also hear me. That's great. So uh, thank you, Peter, for this um, very kind introduction and good morning or hello, everybody, to my talk, uh, which is about the Phospholipid Research Center and the current research in um, phospholipids and their use in drug delivery. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Beat and uh, the Hural Clinem team for, these, uh, for the organization of this really great event, which is full of very excellent presentations. So the outline of my talk is as follows. Uh, first, I would like to briefly describe the uh, Phospholipid Research Center, or short PRC, who we are and what we are uh, actually doing. And in the second part of my talk, I would like to give a a very short summary on actual projects that are all dealing with uh, phospholipids, of course, and um, their use in um, truck delivery. 
Okay, so uh, the PRC was founded in 2006 by renowned uh, international scientists, each of them researching phospholipids, of course, and with the great support of Lipoid uh, GmbH and Phospholipid GmbH. Both companies, um, sorry, laser pointer, so both companies uh, have continued providing financial donations to the PRC to this day. And here you see a picture from the um, uh, from 2006 with this is our uh, president now. This is Professor Alfred Blume. And here we have Professor uh, Gerd Fricker from Heidelberg. And this on the uh, right is uh, Dr. Herbert Trebmann. He is the founder of the Lipoid uh, GmbH. Okay. Um, in the interest of an open and uh, fruitful dialogue between all scientists and developers involved in phospholipid throughout the world, the PRC was uh, conceived as an independent, uh, self-contained nonprofit organization from the very beginning. And uh, we are actively supported by our scientific advisory council. And this council also makes all the decisions regarding approval of projects and so on. Um, there are currently um, 10 members from academia and industry, and each of whom has a special knowledge and also a special interest in phospholipids. So we are covering the whole, yeah, the whole world of phospholipids. As I said, uh, our president is uh, Professor Alfred Blume from the Martin Luther University in Halle, Germany. And our vice president is Professor Gerd Storm from the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And we have, as an, I already mentioned, our honorary president, that is uh, Dr. Herbert Rebmann. And here on the right side, you see our highlights. Since 2006, a total number of 102 projects or research projects have been or are being funded uh, by the PRC. We have an outcome of more than 250 uh, publications. That means uh, peer-reviewed papers and posters. And the PRC has currently 70 members. And if we had uh, or have a look at these 102 projects, um, they can be divided according to the type of uh, the application of the phospholipids into um, parenteral um, projects. This is the, the uh, prominent one. Then we have the topical uh, applications or dormant applications, and we have the oral applications, and we have uh, basic research. And basic research means that our pro uh, these are projects which cannot be assigned to a specific type of application or administrations. And since this parenteral uh, application is the biggest group, one can further subdivide these uh, parental applications into, uh, let's call it subgroups. So we have the stimuli re responsive liposomes, we have the targeted lip liposomes, exosomes, further liposomal applications. We have this very interesting part of lipid nanoparticles, and we have some further applications, of course, without liposomes and um, lipid nanoparticles. And I, I will come to this uh, list later in my talk. And um, if we now look at the origin of the projects, we see that uh, almost 42% of all projects are located in Germany. One half is uh, located in Europe, of course, without Germany, and uh, about 8% are in the rest of the world. So here you have a list and this uh, number in brackets is uh, the number of projects in each country. So here the term other, uh, that means we have one project uh, or have been a project from Croatia, Finland, France, Iran, Israel, N Nigeria, Poland, or Sweden. So, and if you would like to have some more information, uh, you can also have a look at our publication from 2020. Um, but what is the mission of the Phospholipid Research Center? Well, the Phospholipid Research Center is dedicated to uh, enhance the use of various kinds of phospholipids by promoting the use of phospholipids in pharmaceutics, sharing information among scientists and practitioners, and expanding the knowledge of phospholipids and their applications. So there are, let's say, um, three pillars of support, uh, supporting networking and information. 
Um, and to do so, um, our main field of activity is to sponsor PhD and postdoc projects. So in individual researchers or research groups from all over the world are encouraged to submit a research proposal covering research on, of course, phospholipids. And the next uh, deadline is quite soon. So in, at the end of this month, further information can be found on our webpage. And in addition, the PRC also funds workshops offering um, yeah, more practical demonstration courses and or lively discussion rounds. So for example, we uh, will organize a, a workshop um, in the coming liposome research days in Vancouver. And the PRC organizes scientific meetings. Uh, there are two of them. Uh, here we have on the one hand, we have the our researchers day, which takes place biannually. And the main objective um, is to discuss the progress of the funded projects and to offer a platform for discussion and, and the exchange of scientific knowledge. So this is more yeah, a smaller uh, meeting. And alternating, we have uh, our uh, symposia, phospholipids in pharmaceutical uh, research, which also takes place biannually. And uh, this is a larger meeting with international uh, yeah, scientists and speakers. And um, so please save the date for the next symposia in September this year, hopefully in Heidelberg as a face-to-face -face meeting and not which, uh, uh, yeah, virtual. And within this, uh, or during this uh, symposia or these symposia, the PRC awards various prizes. So we have a post award, we have our Tudichum Young Scientist Award for outstanding publications that focuses, or that focus on uh, recent scientific uh, significant contributions to research into phospholipids. And we have our Tudichum Life Award, and that honors uh, lifelong, outstanding, and innovative scientific research in the field of phospholipids. And the last two ever these awardees were um, Professor Dan Kommelin from Utrecht University and Professor Jesse Barenholz from the Hebref University in uh, Jerusalem. And both of them uh, will give also a presentation at this Klinem Summit. And <laughs> you can be curious uh, to see who gets the award in this year. And uh, for this prize, you cannot uh, apply, but for the Young Scientist Award, you can apply by submitting the relevant scientific publication. And young means uh, 35 years of age or younger. And the application will start on May the uh, 15th. OK. Having said that, I will now introduce to you some of our projects that are all dealing with phospholipids in any way. But first of all, um, let me ask the question, what, what makes phospholipids such interesting molecules? Well, phospholipids, and by phospholipids, I mean natural as well as synthetic ones, are broadly used excipients in pharmaceutical technology. They are used as wetting agents, as emulsifiers, builders of different lipid mesophases, such as closed lipid vesicles, liposomes, micelles, inverted micelles, and so on. And these functional properties are applied in many types uh, of pharmaceutic formulations, such as suspensions, different types of uh, emulsions, solid dispersions, lipid nanoparticles, drug phospholipid complexes, complexes, et cetera, et cetera. And such formulation types can be used in any dosage form, for example, in tablets, in capsules, in injections, in creams, and so on and so forth. And with res respect to their physiological role, phospholipids possess a very low toxicity profile and are suitable for any route of administrations. Uh, that means for parenteral administrations, for oral administrations, dermal or topical administrations, and so on. And for the last couple of minutes in my talk, I would like to focus on, as I said before, on the parental application or the parental route of administration. And I will give some examples of projects which are actually supported by the Phospholipid um, Research Center. 
Okay, so uh, we will start uh, with the parenteral one, of course, and uh, with the stimuli re responsive liposomes. And here we have two projects. Um, the first one is uh, from Mans Porkgarten. He uses uh, with the title radiation re responsive liposomes for controlled release of and tumor penetration of radiotherapy dose enhancers. And the second one is by Heiyang Xiang from the University of Texas. And he, uh, this uh, project is about highly photosensitive phospholipid nanovesicles for near-infrared light triggered local anesthesia. The second one is almost finished. And if you have a closer look at the first one, um, uh, in this project, Oman's uses um, uh, liposomes. They include some uh, oxidation-sensitive uh, phospholipids. They include uh, phosphosensitizer that is anchored at the at, uh, at a phospholipid here in the, yeah, in the bilayer part. And they contain gold nanoclusters in the aqueous core of the liposome. And during the photodynamic therapy or radiation therapy, these compounds will generate um, high levels of reactive oxygen, oxygen species that will oxidize the lipids and release the gold nanoclusters in the tumor. And then with, uh, again, radiotherapy, one can specifically um, yeah, irradiate the tumor. So that's the project by Mans Progarten from the University of Grenoble, for example. So the second, uh, yeah, the second group of projects is about targeted liposomes. So here we have three projects, namely uh, um, Michele Bernasconi from the Bern University Hospital, this project is about targeted liposomal drug delivery to pediatric sarcomas beyond the EPR effect. We have a second project uh, from uh, Ulrike Müller from the University of Heidelberg in Germany about liposome mediated delivery of biologicals to the brain, so to cross the blood brain barrier as novel therapeutic strategy for Alzheimer's diseases. And the last one is uh, a project by Jay Prakash from the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And this is about immune simulating liposomes targeting M2 macrophages, so not M1, so M M2 macrophages to er 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 eradicate cancer. So, uh, yeah, these are the targeted uh, liposome projects. And the third subgroup uh, um, of the parent application of phospholipids containing projects that are all using liposomes, but these liposomes are not stimuli responsive for targeted ones. And here we have six projects. I wanna, would like to go uh, to, to name them briefly. We have a project by Hermann Nürschel from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Uh, we have a, a project by Ruchi Banzal from the University of Trente, Enrico Mastro Battista, University of Utrecht, Paola Luciani, University of Bern. I would like to, um, yeah say some words about this project in a couple of minutes. One, one minute. Uh, yes, so. uh, yes. And uh, uh, yeah, OK. So I will skip this one. And um, yeah, I would like to say maybe I will short this with this uh, project from, from um, uh, Paola Luciani. It's about uh, the development of phospholipid-based depot technology um, for sustained drug release. So, she uses uh, negatively charged phospholipids in a, uh, as a liposomal dispersion, which includes the IPA in one uh, yeah, batch. And in the second solution, uh, she uses um, divalent cations, so calcium or magnesium. And if they put both together, we uh, get a nice uh, depot and the, uh, uh, the drug can be re released over some time. Okay, so I have to skip the lipid nanoparticles, but I think there are a lot of uh, talks about this topic. And I would also skip the last one, uh, the further applications, um, which is also about some LipoDisc, really nice uh, stuff. And I will conclude or will sum up very briefly. Uh, and I can say that phospholipids are indeed really great molecules. Having said that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions maybe uh, now or in the debate room later on. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Simon. And there are no questions from the audience. So um, I would indeed like to suggest that uh, possible questions okay. at, at the very end when, when you agree. 
Can yes. we move now to uh, the next uh, speaker, which is Professor Alfred Farr. He received his uh, PhD in biophysics from the University of Konstant, the Free University of Berlin. He conducted research on phospholipid membranes as a subprojector of UC special areas. Then he worked at Sandoz in Basel, Department of Biopharmaceutics. At the same time, he habilitated in pharmacy at the University of Basel. He then followed the call to a professorship for phosphorus technology at the University of Marburg, from where he later moved to the chair of pharmaceutical technology in Jena. His research focused on the field of liposomes, uh, and uh, Alfred Farr founded three companies in three countries where liposomes are being researched and applied in the drug delivery system. As a sign of his expertise, he has published more than two. 200 scientific papers and wrote two textbooks and is listed as an inventor of several patents. So, um, Alfred, uh, the floor is yours with uh, your seminar on uh, the title Why Did Father Universe and Mother Nature Beget Lipids? Audio ein. Can you hear me? Yes, great. So yes. Sw switching to my screen. And now you should see my screen, right? Yes, we do. Thank great. <clears throat> so uh, thank you very much, Peter, for your kind introduction. Uh, gosh. Yeah. We are starting a bit earlier than phospholipids, and we are starting with one of the uh, great questions in our life, what is life? So life is a collective term for a multitude of material phenomena in nature that are in co constant regulated and exchange of energy, matter and information displayed by this kind of uh, simple uh, diagram. Of course, this needs a wall to separate from the outside, but the entity has to interact with the outside to be a life organism. <clears throat> this compartment wall has to consist of blocks, should be self-associating amphiphiles, which should be built stable, but not too stable membranes, as for example, replication or dividing. And this means we use for this, and we have nature had to use for this lipids. So the lipids at the early stage of life, let's say three billion and more years ago, won't be phospholipids as agreed by many scientists because this is a too complicated structure. And Phospholipid membrane permeability would be too small if there are no channels or transporters which will not be there in the early stage of life, of course. So presumably fatty acids would be the first membrane building blocks and agreed us that this was presumably oleic acid. Oleic acid has got uh, some uh, peculiar uh, properties, for example, uh, at a pH which is smaller than the pKa of the uh, oleic acid, it's of course protonated and it will just be a spot of fat somewhere in water. At the pH of larger than the pKa, it will, would be completely deprotonated and this would mean that it will be organized at higher concentrations as micelles when the pH of the medium here is about the pKa there, there is a kind of distribution of this and this in the whole mixture and this allows then to make membranes which finally will, will be formed to vesicles. So but if we ask 
the question where to get the building blocks for membranes from in the early Earth. All of you remember the Miller-Urey experiments where inorganic molecules are put into this water vessel. This is heated up and then uh, it gives a va vaporous stream over it for days or weeks. There is lightning to there and what kind of surprise it was in 1953 that all this uh, produced then amino acids, alcohols, aldehydes, cyanides, carboxylic acids even, but no lipids. So the big question is and was and will be there in the future as well, where did the first lipids come from? And I'll tell you about two hypotheses. The first one is lipid formation by aqueous fischer tropsch type synthesis, which happens at temperatures between 100 and 400 degrees. This is used in industry to make uh, lipids and was also used, for example, in Germany, because these are German names, for get, making artificial uh, petrol when they were cut off from petrol. The principle for that case, we use formic or oxalic acid heated in a vessel. And this had to be a stainless steel vessel because the steel works as a catalyst. This works at 150 to 250 degrees centigrade and will yield a mixture of C2, 12, sorry, to C33 lipids. And when you look at all the complicated diagram, you see here they produce really then long chained uh, fatty acids, let's call it that, and also uh, alkanols, which means just long uh, chains with an alcohol at the end. All this could happen at the so-called hydrothermal vent deep in the sea, volcanoic events in the deep sea, which gives the high temperature and also iron would be there. So this seems to work, but also there's the second hypothesis, which is uh, a cosmic one. So carbon containing meteorites contains some percent of hydrocarbons, uh, also this in the travel through the universe, uh, surface catalysis with heat. Heat is delivered by the suns, by the stars, which uh, are there when the meteorite pass it, yields alkanes and fatty acids. And you might ask, well, this can't be a lot of stuff, but in the first hundred million years of Earth life, uh, there was an estimated carbon fall on Earth of 10 to the power of 16 to 10 to the power of 18 kilograms. Today, it's about 10 to the power of 7 kilograms per year, which uh, the Earth gets gains weight from meteorites. And this amount here is more than the biomass today on Earth, which is about 6 times 10 to the power of 14. For imagination, today's carbon from biomass would cover the whole earth for some millimeters only. The carbon, the carbon only from the meteorites during this uh, uh, heavy bombardment, however, would cover the, the, the whole earth by 1.6 centimeters to 1.6 meters. So there was a lucky chance to get a meteorite just after it had impacted the earth. It was isolated, uh, sterile, and then one scratched on the surface. And Dima could then look at the uh, things, what happens if one scratches some surface material from the meteorite and put it into water. So you see there are vesicles, right? Vesicles formed by itself. And if one looks at the uh, material which is there, but these are some kind of fatty acids. Most of this material has got branched, uh, is branched, but in 
principle, it's the kind of fatty acid what uh, we are looking for. This is just the modern phospholipid, okay. So fatty acids, it's okay for the first cells, but was that all? The good thing of fatty acids is easy to produce, right? Permeable for smaller and mid-sized substances, which is important for uh, the early cells because food in, waste out without any specialized transporters. But the bad thing is with increasing concentration in the water of mono and divalent ions, these fatty acid membranes will co collapse and they only can exist at this uh, concentrations and lower in water. And also at evolving metabolism, smaller molecules cannot be retained in this kind of leaky vesicle. So it means we have to get something better. So, and this we come now into play of the PRC, the phospholipids, but how to evolve from fatty acid to phospholipids. And again, the uh, meteorite, the cosmos comes into play. Uh, sorry. The, uh, there are some materials, gosh, I'm sorry. No, it should stop somehow. Uh, yeah, it should stop somehow. So these are Schreiber site materials, it's a nice name. These are iron, nickel, phosphide mi minerals, which are common in iron, nickel meteorites. And upon corrosion, this this can be oxygen or hydrate and so on, not necessarily oxygen. Phosphate is then accessible. And then this nice experiment shows if you add decanol, hexanol, ethanol in this combination, in this proportion, together with this uh, phosphate at 100 degrees centigrade for 24 hours, one gets decile phosphate and hexile phosphate in this relation. So Earth can do it with the help of the universe to get the first kind of phospholipids. So make a big jump to the first really phospholipid and this is DOPA. This is the simplest phospholipid which one can imagine and which could be synthesized by origin of life ideas by an acyl transferase ribozyme. Okay, lo look at this experiment done by Budin and Schostak. They, they made vesicles, oleate to DOPA, 90 to 10, so that's a mixture of oleate and phospholipid, and put this together with uh, oleate vesicles. And then look what happens. And what you can see is that the surface area, it means the number and the uh, sizes of this uh, mixture grows on, on the same time the uh, oleate vesicles shrink, which means there's a kind of competition between this and this and the modern one with winds. And also here you can see what happened in the diagram. Here is the uh, mixture vesicle liposome with the micelles and the, um, and the oleate vesicles. And then this goes, this grows so fast. Look at the time frame here that there is no time for water to diffuse into it. So it means one gets elang elongated structures which by slightly shaking it will uh, be uh, put into small vesicles with this uh, DOPA oleate. What does it mean in terms of evolution? This is then a functional evolution. The first advantage of this phospholipids is the stability to dive well cations and varying pH. So, and the permeability here is the oleate 
vesicle membrane, large molecules can go out and in, which is necessary for primitive cells. More and more, we get phospholipids then in this, more and more than it means that substances will be kept out and in the inside, then small substances can uh, be in, evolved for, for example, ATP. Of course, at that time, the first transporters have to be uh, invented then by the evolution. So we come to the phospholipids itself. Nature has had billions of years to build beautiful tricks into the developing phospholipids that we today barely know and understand even less so far. And uh, a nice review article about this you can find here. And I will show you some tricks now on the stage. What has nature built on tricks into it? For example, giving birth to a DMPC liposome, you see here a liposome in a liposome, which happens quite often if you produce liposomes larger than 100 nanometers. Put a laser beam, a strong laser beam uh, of six milliwatts to this place here, and then observe in seconds uh, what happens. This inside liposome will finally go out. So the mama uh, DMP's liposome will give birth to the daughter liposome. Or what we have experienced in our own experiments, DMPC liposomes produced by high pressure homogenization kept at 13 degrees, suddenly we get rippled nanotubes and when we rise the temperature again, then we get large liposomes. So at 13 degrees, one gets really tubes out of a mixture of small uh, DMPC liposomes. And then one peculiar thing, we call it super crowding. Uh, first, I have to introduce to you the ethanol ejection method for producing liposomes. You have heard this uh, principle already by Andreas Wagner from Polymoon. Put phospholipids into ethanol, put it into water. The uh, ethanol will distribute. The phospholipids will form into membrane sheets, which finally will be liposomes. All right. And then if one puts some substances here around, you will find them, of course, also inside the liposome. What we did was using ferritin, 12.5 nanometer diameter, negative surface charge, about 4,000 iron atoms in the core, which means you can fo follow it easily by electron microscopy. All right, this is the principle ferritin solution. Put lipids in ethanol, you get liposomes, and you should find some in, uh, encapsulated ferritins. So uh, a if one calculates the concentration and so on, then one should get this kind of uh, thing. What we also do, it's a Poisson type distribution, of course. Two minutes, and uh, Alfred. How many minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay, Excellent. great. Uh, but we also find a super crowding, so uh, completely unexpected and uh, just going shortly to that, you see this we would expect according to number of uh, ferritin and diameter of liposome, but what we really get is the completely improbable amount of ferritins in one liposome. This also can be done by uh, using ribosomes to get closer to the nature. We also can find really uh, that we can produce proteins inside with this kind of uh, pure system mixture. And we really get an in 100 nanometer liposomes production of GFP, which also improbably normally. So I skip this and the end is near as Peter van Hogewis told me. Uh, do we 
already know what happens when our liposomes or LNPs, tricky constructions by us, interact with tricky biological membranes, for example, absorption of amphiphiles to liposomes, growing and dividing of liposomes by unknown triggers, accumulation of substances by crowding mechanisms, opening and closing, forming of channel structures. So if we compete with nature's by using liposomes in therapy, we should be aware of this. And final slide, this uh, would not have been possible, these experiments, which are still going on by uh, the nice cooperation to doing a Synthel project financed by the EU, Professor Pierre Luigi and Professor Pascal Estano were involved with that, and my uh, Alexander from Humboldt Foundation stipend helped a lot for doing this. So, and, and also experiments are running in a small company in China. So, uh, thank you very much, and I have to close. Okay, thank you very much, Alfred, for this uh, very interesting uh, seminar. Uh, there are no questions from the audience, so because of time constraints, I would like to propose that uh, possible questions can be addressed um, after our stream at 9.20. Yeah? Okay, so please close your um, uh, slide show of it. Yeah, okay. So it's now my turn to, uh, to to give you some presentation. It's the title, provocative title, liposomes and LMPs. Uh, are they the best uh, nanotechnology? And uh, of course, I would like to thank the organizers to give me the opportunity to discuss uh, this theme. I think in nanotechnology, this is always a question, what um, sort of carrier should you use for especially parental administration and what are the pros and cons of uh, of these various particles which are possible. So topic of discussion is liposomes and lipid and nanoparticles. They have quite similar structure as you see in this uh, picture. Um, liposomes, they have much more water in the inside in the internal vacuole. Whereas lipid nanoparticles are really packed with um, um, complexes of cationic lipids and uh, mainly RNA molecules. So that's the major difference. Both have a surrounding uh, layer of uh, phospholipids. Uh, so they, in both the particle types, they, these phospholipids, these so called helper lipids, uh, play a significant role to um, form uh, the particles. So the intravenous use of, of liposomes is the focus of, uh, of uh, the, my uh, seminar. And uh, because the liposomes as to play a major role after oral administration, and also after uh, dermal administration, they're used to enhance uh, skin interaction. Uh, so the intravenous use of liposomes is more prominent because and in order to compare liposomes with other uh, particles, it is not an easy question because you can consider this from the academic and the scientific uh, pers uh, scientific perspective on one side, so the number of publications, for instance, but you can also consider it from the industrial perspective, which part of a particle is better. So based on the analysis of the number of products, sales of the products, the benefits to the patients, etc. Another complication is that uh, you notice that the variable quality of, of publications are sometimes it's very hard to uh, judge uh, certain findings in, in the literature. So these are the complications for comparing the liposomes with other type of particles. Um, in this slide, you see the overview of class of approved parental nanoproducts. So it's also related to the definition of 
what is nanotechnology this was in the past uh, sometimes not not very clear uh, for instance speculated uh, protein conjugates are also considered to be nanotechnology in the older days it would be defined as a uh, chemical modification of an uh, of a chemical molecule that is now considered as nanotechnology. Elderman particles of interest, iron particles, diagnostic particles, nanosuspension. They are two products of states in which nanosuspension of, of drugs, so with very small particles, nanometers, are being in, uh, injected intravenously, and last but not least, uh, liposomes. So how can we um, assess these type of particles? First of all, in comparison to liposomes, the peculated protein conjugates are really no drug carrier. They only carry the protein itself. Albumin particles uh, are indeed a in, uh, in drug uh, carrier. Uh, so there are two products on the market uh, based on this technology to bind uh, mainly polysoluble drugs to albumin particles namely Ebrexane and Sirolimus. Uh, iron particles, they're also not designed for other drugs. The purpose of this is to, to administer iron um, salts in uh, intravenously. Also, nanosuspension are pure, uh, basically, drug uh, particles coated with uh, surfactants in order to uh, disperse uh, the nanocrystals. The diagnostic particles are not intended for chronicle and repeat repetitive use that are only intended for single use. So that's uh, basically the difference with liposomes, which are um, a versatile uh, carrier for any drug, uh, which I will elaborate in more detail in the following slides. Um, the main characteristics of liposome technology is that uh, the nanomaterials, the phospholipids, um, as discussed, are available a large scale at G GMP quality. Uh, a large scale production is possible. There are stable products on the market. There are many registered products of liposomes. There are combi and single products on the market, and liposomes are suitable for any injection route. Pharmaceutical use of the liposomes is uh, manifold. Uh, most prominent is the tumor targeting by means of the enhanced permeation retention effect, macrophage targeting, solubilization, because the liposomes have possibility to uh, associate with a poorly soluble drug in the lipid domain of the phospholipid bilayer. They can be used as depot injectable, uh, they're used for siRNA therapy as the um, result of the Onpetro product, which will be discussed probably many times in this symposium. Uh, liposomes can be used as vaccination adjuvant and also last but not least, um, it can be used in the form of LMPs uh, as part of an mRNA vaccination. Uh, so prominent uh, products with large cells are uh, Doxil, Doxorubicin liposome, also available as Metrocabison, which is the next uh, speaker. Ambisome is a very uh, well-known product. Exparel is a depot formulation of a local anesthetic. Shingrix is a um, very interesting vaccine against uh, shingles. It's uh, sales of more, uh, one, more than one billion English uh, sterling pound, uh, pound sterling, sorry, uh, per year. And last but not least, of course, the spike fax uh, and Comenati, so the both the mRNA vaccine for combat of COVID-9 are uh, well-known examples of the broad uh, and commercial use of, of liposomes in part of vaccination. Uh, there are many uh, smaller products on the market with liposomes, which uh, sometimes have the orphan drug stage. Francisvisidin uh, is an example of a liposome, which um, um, solvable drugs is solubilized. Makipo is an example. Mipec is an um, product uh, which MPPD is targeted for macrophages. Fixtures is a combi product of two cytostatics and one liposome. It's very interesting. Myoset is an alternative to doxorubicin. 
Holophyte is an other cytostatic encapsulated in lipidomes. Ableset is an alternative to um, MBZone. And Opeto is the classical example of um, a gene therapy using SI RNA in combination with LMPs. <coughs> I have to watch on what time I am. Okay, yeah. So the unlocking and the liposome technology is only possible by the availability of the nanomaterial uh, without uh, the large scale availability of uh, pharmaceutical grade phospholipids. Uh, liposomes cannot be used uh, commercially in the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry is using synthetic as well as natural phospholipids. They are safe in use, biocompatible and biodegradable, as um, Alfred Power already pointed out. They are coming from uh, Mother Nature, and that's why uh, there are no biocompatibility and biodegradable uh, or biodegradation issues. They are known to re regulatory authority based on the many registered products and uh, due to the versatility of a biological membrane, many fan and phys physical chemical options to design the liposome carrier are possible. That makes this uh, carrier so attractive. <clears throat> so what sort of uh, future research uh, directions uh, could be uh, imagined based on the status of knowledge on the liposome technology nowadays? Uh, first of all, uh, the EPR char characteristics, uh, which for some tumors have more than other tumors, could be analyzed in advance so that you can predict uh, is how far a liposome uh, therapy could become uh, successful. This uh, enhanced permeation retention effect, uh, which is the main cause of, of getting tumor targeting, could be uh, possibly enhanced by pharmacological and physical means. Pharmacological means that you uh, create so-called immunoliposomes by anchoring uh, antibodies to the surface of, uh, of the liposomes to make it more attractive for tumor cells. And physical means means that for instance, uh, you can make thermosensitive liposomes, which uh, uh, have increased uh, permeability of the membrane at uh, slightly increased temperatures of physi physiological conditions uh, so that you heat up the tumor at a certain um, uh, localized site and then hope that the cytostatics, for instance, which is encapsulated in the liposomes, can be released at the site of uh, desired action. We can also try to uh, reduce uh, drug access to organs, which can cause uh, dose limiting toxicity of the bioactive. bioactive. So that's basically what's, what's the, the principle of embisome and also of doxil, that you um, um, guide the drug to other organs, uh, which are not that sensitive for the toxicity of the drug. So embisome nephrotoxicity plays a role, and doxorubicin is um, cardiotoxicity playing a major role, which can be avoided by means of encapsulation into the liposomes. And of course, uh, knowing where the liposomes are going to, for instance, macrophages or certain immune cells or cells with endotoxic uh, properties, you could design liposomes for, uh, for uh, that they are these cells uh, in particular will take up the liposomes loaded with drugs so that when these cells play a role in a certain pathological pathway that they can be manipulated in a more efficient way by encapsulating the drug specific for these cells uh, to these, uh, to these um, cells. <clears throat> And um, physically triggering drug release uh, is basically uh, by uh, ultrasound and, and so on, so that you destabilize uh, the liposomes at the site of action by uh, means of focused uh, physical, uh, let's say, irritation of enhancement of energy in certain, for instance, tumor areas. 
to uh, trigger the drug release at the site at which the drug should, should act. Also, uh, exploiting combination treatment regimens. Uh, classic example is, uh, for instance, the, the product fixtures, which is combining two tight aesthetics in uh, one liposome. So make, making this combination much more efficacious than if you would administer the dr drugs uh, without liposomes. Um, as you notice, uh, mainly uh, all drugs or generic drugs are being combined with liposomes, but could also be considered to combine new drugs with, uh, with uh, liposomes, but this is uh, by pharmaceutical companies not that uh, a preference because of the, the, the risk of developing um, a new chemical entity and a new technology uh, at the same time is um, sometimes too much. So they take it forward step by step and first developing a classical formulation, which can then be further optimized at a later stage to a liposomal form. Uh, continuing the exploration of possibilities for liposome for local sustained release, so this EPO injectable idea could be further elaborated. And of course, the last evolution and the use of uh, LMPs opens many avenues to use mRNA and also sRNA for many other diseases. So this will probably the focus of uh, research in the future. So what can we conclude from this? Um, that um, whether liposomes are the best uh, carrier is maybe probably too much to say because this uh, mainly dependent on the drug substance, whether the drug substance is compatible with the uh, liposome technology, whether it makes sense to, to design a liposome around the sort of drug or also from the disease perspective, it could be uh, questions whether a liposome is the ideal carrier. But anyway, based on the track record of liposomes, they are more uh, established than any other uh, nanotechnology for parental administration. That's why you can conclude that the nanotechnology field can learn from the liposome experience and should seriously take into account the challenges and opportunities which biology brings to the table of nanomedicine uh, designers. So that's basically my uh, contribution to this stream. And um, I have to check now myself whether there are any questions in the chat room. I don't think so. So um, yeah, I would say, and there are also no questions from the other speakers, then um, the possible uh, questions can be addressed in, uh, after uh, this um, stream. And I would like to uh, invite uh, Alberto Cabizon now to, to give the next uh, seminar. And Alberto Cabizon will introduce him uh, briefly. Is professor of medicine and head of research now in oncology center, the Shah Sedek Medical Center at the Hebrew University of New Jerusalem. Alberto Gabison's apprenticeship research contribution played a key role in the development of long circle liposomes, now the stell liposomes, and peculated liposome doxorubicin. Unique cancer formulation extensively used in clinical support for pharmacological safety advantage of a conventional chemotherapy. He's founder and director of Lipomedics Pharmaceuticals and Lefco Pharmaceuticals, two startup companies aimed at advancing the prevention of the field of cancer nanomedicine. So the title of his seminar is uh, Drug Co-Encapsulation in Lipid Nanoparticles for a Multimodality Approach to Cancer Therapy. So the next 50 minutes are yours, Alberto. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to present at this meeting. <coughs> uh, I will uh, uh, talk mainly on drug co-encapsulation uh, in... Uh, in liposomes, which I see as one of the examples of lipid nanoparticles. 
Um, but in, in, and in the case I'm going to talk, it's uh, going to be a multimodality approach to cancer therapy based on chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So uh, this first slide, after Peter's introduction, I will make it very short. Uh, what are really the pharmacologic advantages of nanomedicines? Well, you have already heard that slow drug release, changes in tissue distribution, reduction of toxicity. These are probably the simplest and, and most uh, um, uh, clear uh, advantages of nanomedicines. And this has been established with Doxil and many other examples of other products. It is just making new tricks with all drugs. We have the, the particular example of the stealth pharmacokinetics, which, uh, in which the long circulation half-life provides a, an enhanced permeability and retention effect with enhanced drug delivery in tumors. And Doxil is for that the best example. Um, and, and other things, I will skip uh, some of the next uh, few lines. And, and just to say that if you really can combine all these advantages, you really get to the really to the holy grail of nanomedicine. So um, I will introduce you first to one of the uh, uh, drugs that uh, we are using in in our uh, novel uh, co-encapsulated formulation, and it's a nitrogen containing bisphosphonates. These drugs are very highly water soluble, very hydrophilic. Uh, but they are hardly any, they have hardly any cell permeability. And when they are used in vivo, uh, mainly for two purposes, treatment of osteoporosis and treatment of bone metastasis, they do, uh, they do work mainly only at the level of the bone um, uh, by, uh, <clears throat> by uh, really by uh, destroying uh, osteoclasts or inhibiting osteoclasts. And, uh, but they have a plethora of effects both of anti direct anti-tumor effects and indirect anti-tumor effects. And as you will see here, the two most powerful uh, nitrogen containing bisphosphonates are zoledronate and alendronate. We will focus today on this compound, alendronate. Um, just one quick slide on the mechanism of action by which uh, these bisphosphonates exert their, uh, their inhibition of uh, cancer cells or other cells uh, such as macrophages. Well, it, the, the key step is an, in, an inhibition uh, in the mevalonate pathway of a farnesyl pyrophosphate synthase, as you can see here. And this uh, results in, uh, in the uh, appearance of non-peptidic phosphoantigens that are expressed by the cells um, uh, that are uh, exposed to nitrogen containing bisphosphonates. Uh, and in addition, this inhibition, the downstream effect is that you, you have an inhibition of the synthesis of cholesterol and of small GTPases such as RAS, uh, RO, RAC. And so that uh, these are very important in the growth uh, signaling. So, so these are the main mechanisms by which uh, uh, the, uh, uh, these uh, bisphosphonates work. These, uh, the phosphoantigens by themselves, as uh, stated here, they uh, cause the stimulation of a subset of gamma delta uh, T lymphocytes, which, are, which, is, which is exclusive uh, of primates. They, do not, they are not present in uh, subprimate mammalian species. And as you see here in this cartoon, um, these gamma T cells, gamma delta T cells can be activated by presenting these uh, phosphoantigens either in tumor-associated macrophages or antigen-presenting cells, which are derived from monocytes. And uh, uh, they uh, can also be, uh, uh, the gamma delta T cells can also be actually uh, presented, um, uh, can be activated, sorry, by presenting the, by tumor cells that present the, the phosphoantigens. Uh, and engaging then the gamma delta T cells can engage through the T cell receptor and kill the tumor cells. So, so this is a, an important path that has not yet been recognized well. Uh, uh, they, gamma, gamma delta T cells are only about 1% of the peripheral 
T cell population. However, they can be expanded by, <coughs> by bisphosphonates because they proliferate under the, uh, under the uh, stimulation of bisphosphonates and they can reach much higher numbers up to 50% uh, in, uh, in expanded ex vivo cultures. So uh, this is an important side of these uh, bisphosphonates that uh, uh, can be exploited in many ways. Uh, this is just uh, one way in which we, we already several years ago, uh, we proposed to, to use uh, the bisphosphonate. We encapsulated alendronate in liposomes and we could show that <clears throat> in combination with gamma delta T cells, as you see in these experiments on day 29 and 36, you see that the, the mice treated with either free alendronate or liposomal alendronate only or gamma T cells, gamma delta T cells only, they were full of tumor while those treated with a combination of, of uh, gamma delta T cells and liposomal alendronate were uh, practically free of tumor and survived much longer. So, um, uh, you have here a summary of the effects of this formulation of liposomal alendronate. It's a pegylated liposomal formulation of, uh, of alendronate. And in fact, uh, I, have, I have already mentioned the, the activation of gamma delta T cells, but there is more than that. There is also an M1 polarization, which brings you uh, the good macrophages to work, those that are actually anti tumoral macrophages. And there are other effects on the in the tumor stroma and in the bone. And in fact, this, in this way, liposomes actually can actually act as a, a way to repurpose alendronate, a very well-known drug used for, for tens of years in the, in, in the treatment of cancer. Now, we went further one, one step ahead and we decided to do a combination of alendronate with doxorubicin. Uh, to achieve a co-delivery of two drugs, which uh, may have a synergistic activity that will reflect the direct cytotoxicity of uh, doxorubicin and the indirect immune-mediated anti-tumor effects of the nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates. As, and, and we assume that this will overcome uh, some forms of drug resistance and eventually result in a kind of product that we may refer it as a super doxer. So these are the the, the, the statements, double attack on tumor cells and tumor associated macrophages. And then there are non overlapping toxicities between the, the two compounds, there are different mechanisms of actions. There is a co-delivery in space and time, immunological anti-tumor effects. And as I say, perhaps we can overcome some forms of drug resistance. In this slide, you can see on the left, uh, uh, the pegylated liposomal alendronate formulation with alendronate, which uh, actually uh, is soluble inside the liposome, so you don't see anything. Uh, but however, when you encapsulate uh, alendronate and doxyl together, they form a complex that precipitates. And you can see here by cryotem the rods that appear in, this, in these liposomes. This is the way the, the mechanism of, of formulation goes. We are using actually the same backbone uh, of uh, lipids as in the doxyl formulation. And we do passive encapsulation of alendronic acid. We use an ammonium alendronate salt to, so that we generate an ammonium gradient. The ammonia goes out, doxorubicin goes in, and then alendronate doxorubicin forms a salt, which you see precipitates here on the right. And if you compare head to head the doxyl liposomes by cryotem and the plug liposomes, PLAD is the abbreviation for this alendronate doxorubicin liposomes. You can see do in doxyl, you have thinner and longer rods, which tend to cause a more oval shape of the liposomes. In the case of PLAD, the rods are uh, less compact, they are thicker and shorter, and the vesicles are, are more spherical. We have shown that this formulation of PLAD is very stable in uh, uh, and as you see here, neither alendronate leaks nor doxorubicin leaks during uh, shelf life storage. And also in plasma stability assays, 
uh, the, these liposomes are very stable. Uh, no, nothing shows up in the protein or free uh, fractions eluting from these columns after incubation with plasma at 37 degrees. Uh, the same for alendronate and the same for doxorubicin. So um, um, what happens in vivo when we label uh, these formulations? We have a great tumor uptake. As you see here, experiments done at the King's uh, College uh, uh, in London by Dr. L the group of Dr. Rosales uh, using um, PET CT. Uh, they actually expect CT, sorry. They show you here great uptake in the tumor uh, implanted here in the, um, in the lower belly of the, of the mouse. Uh, the, the, the actually, it is as high as the liver uptake, just, just only below the spleen uptake, we get up to 25% of injected dose per gram in these uh, studies, in these imaging studies. We can also show that when we do an ex vivo, um, an ex vivo uh, extraction of the tissues and we measure uh, the radioactivity. So as you see, once again, we have about 25% of the injected dose per gram in tumor. This is in a mouse model of sarcoma. And you see that we actually have more, when you see the, the orange bars, we have more uh, with, uh, with the, in the tumor than in the liver. Once again, only the spleen beats uh, the tumor compartment. The rest of the tissues have much less. And of course, in the blood also, we still have a large amount because this, uh, this formulation is, a, is also a short, uh, sorry, a long-term circulating formulation to some extent, uh, very close to the half-life of doxiel. Um, uh, these are more pharmacokinetic studies that we conducted with this superdoxiel formulation. It is, uh, as you see here, the drug levels are slightly, but not significantly greater than, than doxiel. Doxiel is PLD, uh, PLAD is, is the alendronate of doxorubicin. Of course, free doxorubicin is much further, farther below, about 30, 40 fold less than doxil or PLAD. Uh, the plasma drug levels are somewhat greater with doxil, uh, so that the tumor to plasma ratios are actually better for the PLAD than for the doxil formulations. And, and as you see here, this is another way in the, in the, to look at the, at the tissue distribution uh, by measuring doxorubicin and not a radioactive marker, but the results are very comparable to indium labeled alendronate when we do extraction of doxorubicin, once again, we see that uh, the spleen is, is, has the highest levels and uh, the tumor has uh, also high levels greater than the liver. In red, you have doxyl. In this blue, you have the PLAD or super doxyl formulation. And, uh, and uh, so that, that gives you an idea of how these things look when uh, the, you look at doxorubicin pharmacokinetics and tissue distribution. And uh, what about uh, therapeutic studies in mice? This tumor, the 41, is a mouse breast cancer model, which is relatively doxorubicin sensitive. Here we can beat, uh, we can beat uh, PLD, doc doxil. As you see clearly, we see many more um, a, a better uh, inhibition with PLAD. And in fact, uh, we have uh, here, uh, these are the individual uh, curves. And you see here that uh, in blue, we have many more mice uh, with uh, PLAD that uh, uh, remain tumor free than with, uh, than with the doxil. Uh, this is the control group. However, if you see in this slide, in the right uh, panel, if you combine PLAD, with PLD, that is regulated liposomal uh, uh, alendronate, with pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, you do match the results that you can obtain with the co-encapsulation. So, so clearly, it's not that there is a magic behind it. <clears throat> it is just a clear additive effect. Um, although it, you need, of course, to load much more lipid into these mice to give two formulations as opposed to one, uh, okay, we, which is the PLAT formulation. PLD, once again, is less effective, 
Now, in the right-hand side, you see, if you take a highly dox-resistant formulation, now here you see in blue that, that the co-encapsulated formulation, uh, which is PLAD, is better uh, in terms of the survival curve, that also not only than, than doxyl in red, but also than the combination of PLA, alendronate, and doxorubicin in two liposome, in two liposomes given, uh, two different liposomes given along the same time. So um, uh, you can see here now experiments in which we compare, we, we actually uh, come back and look at PLAD in combination with these gamma delta T cells. And once again, we, you can see here that we have great results of uh, suppression of, of, a, of, a, of a cancer using this, uh, um, uh, these uh, tumor, these combinations. If you do only uh, the gamma delta T cells, you have many more tumors than if you do the combination. And, and also, if you do PLAD alone, the PLAD plus gamma delta T cells is superior. So this is, again, one other avenue of, uh, of therapy in which you can combine uh, adoptive immune cell therapy with uh, the PLAD formulation. Um, uh, one more point in which uh, immunotherapy can be combined with this uh, PLAD formulation is uh, using uh, an anti-PD-1, which is an immune checkpoint uh, inhibitor antibody. Here you can see this is at study endpoint, the, the median tumor volumes, and you see that in this doxorubicin-resistant model, doxyl has little effect, PLAD has a significant effect, doxyl plus anti-PD-1 is more effective uh, than doxyl, but the best results are obtained with PLAD plus anti-PD-1. Again, under, uh, under uh, light and uh, em em emphasizing the possibility of combining successful immunotherapy with this co-encapsulated formulation. Recently, we also did a study with our collaborator in Texas, Dr. Irene Labeck, in a, in a mouse sarcoma model in which we looked for doxorubicin uh, fluorescence in dispersed cells from tumors of mice treated with PLAD and uh, doxyl. And we find that, that uh, we find that the, the, much more doxorubicin uh, internalized in cells uh, with PLAD than with doxyl. Uh, most of the doxyl that is in present in tumors is actually extracellular. And, and in fact, what we see is that the big gain of a PLAD over doxyl is in tumor associated macrophages. We can, we, we get much more PLAD than doxyl. Uh, and of course, much more than with free doxorubicin. And, and these are uh, things that may have an important effect since, uh, as you will see here, the, when we look at the, in the same experiment, at the, how these, uh, the phenotypes of these uh, macrophage uh, subpopulations, we can see that PLAD augments the M1 uh, uh, macrophages significantly. You see in blue here, in dark blue, you see the, the effect, uh, uh, the, the M1 in free docs, the M1 in doxyl, and the M1 in, in, in PLAD, which actually gets uh, bigger and larger as a function as percent of the total uh, TAM uh, as the to of the total tumor associated macrophage population. However, in brown, you see here, these are the bad macrophages, the M2 that promote tumor growth. They get this population it looks large with free docs, relatively smaller with doxyl, but even much smaller with PLAD. With PLAD. So we have favorable uh, changes in the, in the macrophage population in tumors with PLAD that probably can explain some of these effects that I have shown before in the therapeutic uh, studies. So in summary, we have co-encapsulation of two active principles in one nanoparticle. And, and this principle has already applied to the, uh, has been applied to the clinic in the case of Vixeos, but Vixeos is a com combination of two cytotoxic drugs. Here we are, we are combining two principles which have different mechanisms of action, which I think should be a more, a more interesting form of applying the co-encapsulation um, uh, principle. And we have the same liposome carrier as in Doxil. Uh, we are using, we, we have the stealth liposome technology, to, uh, to achieve EPR effect. And uh, 
And we are actually doing a combination of chemotherapy with immunotherapy, which is really to, today at the edge of, of, of cancer therapy. So, and, and we, we actually have a two pronged attack on cancer in a single product. We have synergy with cell, th with cell therapy using the gamma delta T cells. And, and we hope that this product could replace uh, doxyl and free doxorubicin in various indications such as metastatic breast cancer and other orphan drug indications such as bone and soft tissue sarcomas. Uh, this product uh, has uh, crystallized uh, the development of this product in a company called Levco, which we hope will take further the, this project ahead. And uh, thank you very much. I have to say thanks, of course, to the liposome community because you always to be, you, you, you have to, to stand on the shoulders of someone really to make significant progress and it's, it, this is the only way. And this is my, my laboratory group in the collaboration with Dr. Adamski from Levco Pharmaceutical. Thank you again. Okay, thank you very much, um, Alberto, for this very nice uh, seminar. Also from chronological perspective, um, nice to see how uh, front research in the liposome area is making progress, starting from the history to uh, nowadays reality. And I got two questions uh, from the audience, so to, to you, Alberto. And the first uh, from, from both from uh, Laila Rabi. Um, she's asking, could you please explain the better results in terms of survival for the co-encapsulation formulation compared to the separate liposomal formulation for DOX and Alembrol? Um, okay, Laila, uh, what uh, the reasons, uh, am, I, am I connected or am I in mute? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, very well, thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, the... Um, uh, we, we, we think that uh, the fact that you are delivering here um, not only doxorubicin, um, which is, of course, causing direct cytotoxic effects on tumor cells as being a chemotherapeutic uh, agent, uh, but we are delivering with the same liposome uh, at the same time and in the same space using the enhanced permeability and retention effect. We are delivering alendronate which uh, in those liposomes tend apparently to go in large amounts to tumor associated macrophages, uh, which play a significant role in, uh, in, uh, uh, in promoting uh, tumor growth and tumor angiogenesis and support in many other ways uh, tumor growth. By suppressing these macrophages, uh, once the alendronate is taken up in liposomal form by these macrophages, it will block uh, the FPP synthase uh, of these uh, uh, macrophages in the mevalonate pathway, and, and, and it suppresses their, uh, their ability to, uh, uh, you know, their, their ability to, to, uh, to their, their viability and, and their ability to, to, uh, to uh, continue supporting the tumor. How is it happening that it, it, it is turning more of them from M1 to M2, I don't know really. Uh, I have to ask for the help from immunologists. That's why I'm collaborating with, uh, with Dr. Labeck. Uh, and uh, and th this is in a mouse model. In humans, we also hope that the, the interaction of gam with gamma delta T cells, the presentation of phosphoantigens, either by these uh, tumor associated macrophages or by tumor cells themselves can also um, uh, activate the gamma delta T lymphocytes that uh, are coming around. And uh, we have published recently a paper. The first author is Francis Mann from the group of Dr. De Rosales, in which he shows that when we inject these uh, liposomes that contain bisphosphonates, there is a higher concentration of gamma delta T cells in tumors. So, so we think that in, in humans, there is gonna be the added effect of the gamma uh, delta T cells to, to get an additional kill on against tumor cells. So these combined uh, ac activities should give you uh, an end effect that gives better tumor suppression. Okay, thank you, 
of it. Uh, and Laila has another question. Uh, could you please explain the reason behind the high accumulation of this formulation in the tumor? So she said 25% ID per gram. In the, and also what was the reason for choosing the sarcoma model in the study? Oh, okay. Uh, well, regarding the EPR effect, uh, there is plenty of uh, arguments in the literature. Some people uh, are still claiming that, uh, and, and, and you know, uh, the great investigators, great laboratories, uh, uh, that uh, it could be a negligible effect in many cases and not a significant effect. We actually, we disagree. We think that the, the EPR effect, if uh, is in uh, in many cases, at least in, in experimental tumors, is a very significant effect in terms of delivery. And it is the result of, a, a, you know, many lectures can be given about it, but it's really the, the neoangiogenesis process, which is really very, very um, uh, imperfect and uh, uh, allows higher vascular permeability, uh, the process of transcytosis, through these uh, endothelial, immature endothelial cells in tumors also can allow for uh, liposomes to escape. Uh, and all this is, is, is uh, actually supported by the fact that you have a very high gradient con of concentration, you know, by diffusion and the, the diffusion and convective forces of having a very high concentration in plasma because these liposomes are cleared very slowly by the reticular endothelial system. So you maintain a, a very sustained high concentrations in plasma and, and you have a, like a weak, a weak wall in, in, this, uh, in these tumors. Now, how true is this about, about human tumors? There is a lot of arguments and, and I don't think we can today uh, really say uh, very clearly what happens. We know that some tumors in humans like Kaposi sarcomas are extremely, have a very high EPR. That has been shown very clearly. And other tumors may have much lower EPR effect. I think uh, Peter referred in his lecture as to the possibility of doing also imaging to, uh, to, to really to know in each individual patients if, uh, the, uh, um, if, this, if this, the tumors, the patient's tumors that we are gonna treat uh, really have high EPR or, or not. We have the means, the technical means to do it. But technically and logistically, it's difficult sometimes, okay? Now, going to your second question, we, we use the sarcoma model because this group of cancers has been largely ignored. And, and we think in terms of clinical development, uh, you know, th there is, in fact, doxil is not approved for sarcomas. You know, it's only free doxorubicin, which is used in sarcomas. So, so we think that it, it is a great opportunity for PLAD, for this product, to, to move along the clinical development uh, quite fast. Uh, and and that's, that's it. Uh, I think sarcomas are very interesting tumors. They have plenty of macrophages in, uh, inside of them. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in many sarcoma tumors, the tumor cells represent only 30% of the cell mass. And there is also a group of bone sarcomas in which uh, the bisphosphonate action may be great by, by sustaining um, healthier uh, bone uh, than uh, than uh, uh, because the tumor erodes the bone uh, and uh, and so so that that was the reason just a practical reason looking ahead at clinical development. Okay, thank you very much, um, Alberto. Um, I think there may be um, more interest now to uh, to do some more um, liposome research based on these interesting seminars. And uh, Simon, a question to you: What what um, the, could the Force Limit Research Center do in terms of funding, and how should uh, people or academic uh, persons apply for funding from uh, the Force Limit Research Center? What is the mechanism of uh, assessment of such proposals? Okay, um, thank you for this question, and uh, uh, yes. Um, as I said, each individual or, or research uh, group can can uh, uh, yeah, submit a, a research proposal, and you will find um, uh, details and how on how to submit such a proposal, and uh, also some templates on our webpage. 
I can post uh, the the link in the in the chat maybe. So I would like or I would say that you can inform uh, about the, the the technical stuff on our web page. And how is the this uh, proceedings? Uh, well, uh, the the uh, uh, scientific advisory council meets two times a year, and the next meeting is uh, in the beginning of July. So as I said. Uh, the next deadline uh, is or will be at the end of May this year and afterwards uh, the Scientific Advisory Council makes a decision on uh, which project is going to be uh, uh, supported by the PRC. And you will get uh, um, an answer quite quickly. So uh, as I said, the deadline is the end of May and uh, the, the next meeting is on beginning of July and you can expect an answer within uh, maybe four weeks after this uh, after this meeting so I I will put the the the, the web page in the chat I hope that okay answers thank the you. question yeah for sure thank you very much Simon and thank you Alfred as well and Alberto for their uh, valuable uh, contributions and the interesting uh, seminars and um, as I've seen, we got now a link to enter the, the room, the Zoom room for verbal uh, questions and debate with the participants. So I would like to invite you uh, to click on this, this link. I see that um, Simon meanwhile has added his link to ask for uh, funding from the Fosprip Research Center for your academic research. And uh, so I wish you all a uh, nice day and uh, we can also see each other probably in the Zoom room for verbal questions and debate. Thank you for your attention and all the best to you. Thank you.